We live in an interactive world where new social media challenges pop up all the time. Some for enjoyment, some for a good cause, others are just plain dangerous. What if you tried a new challenge? One that could transform your life, community, and the world. What if you spent 40 days studying Jesus' words and applying his teachings to everyday life? All focused on five principles. Being, forgiving, serving, giving, and going like Christ. So what are you waiting for? Let's join together and take the Red Letter Challenge. We're on week three of the Red Letter Challenge. How many of you have really enjoyed this? Anybody? Hopefully. (laughs) Okay, good. (laughs) It would have been bad if nobody raised their hand. Uh, Yeah, three weeks ago, we started this 40-day challenge to put Jesus' words into practice. And it's not always been easy, has it? Some of it is, is very challenging, right? It, it requires a lot out of, out of us. But we've been looking at these five um, principles of, of, as Coach said, being and forgiving. This morning, we're going to talk about serving. And the idea of serving really centers around this main idea, and it's that we want to serve because Jesus has served us. We want to serve Jesus because he has served us. Uh, how many of you in here love doing the dishes? Anybody? Anybody love doing dishes? A few of you, actually. Wow. Um, okay. You're not going to relate to this at all because I actually hate doing the dishes. I despise doing dishes, actually. If there's one thing around the house that I just absolutely do not want to do, it's, it's the dishes. Um, what'd you say? I'll dirty them. Yeah, that's right. I will dirty them, but I will not, I, not will not, I, I don't like to do the dishes. And so um, our, we have our kids, they have chores, and so we enslave them. No, I'm kidding. We don't do that. But they, the, part of their chores are doing the dishes, and you know, obviously sometimes my wife and I do it. But I, I'm probably never going to love doing the dishes, right? It's, it's probably just, it doesn't come natural to me. I'm never going to love doing the dishes. Um, but I can still and, and happily might be the wrong word, but I can happily do the dishes at times because I know that like I'm contributing around the house, right? I'm, I'm helping out my, my wife or my kids with the chores. And, you know, my wife, she does so many other things that like being able to like take care of that is, is a good thing. Um, and so it, it's almost like motivation behind what we're doing is more important than what we're actually doing. Does that make sense? Our motivation behind what we do is more important than what we're actually doing. When it comes to serving God, the same applies. Our motivations behind what we do in serving God is more important than what we do. I think inside all of us, if, if if we're just honest, like we like the idea of serving, right? I think, I think all of us have understood like this, this idea, like when we serve, there, there's something that we get out of serving too, right? We, we, we feel good, like helping other people. Um, you know, we, we feel like we have a purpose, right? And so I, I know that inside of us, we, we want to serve, I think, but sometimes on the other hand, we, we don't really want to and we don't feel like serving, right? How many of you have committed to doing something and then the next day when you wake up, you're like, why did I do why did I do that? It's like you, you've worked all week, you've had a hectic week, your kids' soccer and everything else, and you're like, fine, I'll, I'm going to help with the food distribution on Saturday. So you have to wake up at 7 on Saturday morning, and you're like, why did I do that? Right? And maybe it's just me. Anybody else feel that way? Okay, thank you. But, you know, like I, I have a good you know, my, my attitude's right, like I, my heart is to, to do right, but when, when it comes to doing it, I wake up and I'm like, ah, oh, but what do I do? I, I get up and I, I you know, m- get ready and, and push myself and make myself go and do it. And you know what always happens? Um, when, when, whenever I don't feel like doing it and I just push myself to do it, at the end of it, I, I, I think to myself, you know, I'm really glad I did this, right? I'm really glad that I went out and I served because of the people that were impacted, because of the conversations that I've had, because of, you know, the meaningful things that happened. And so serving for most of us does not come naturally to us. Is there anybody that serving comes really naturally to you? Anybody? A few of you, okay? So a few of us, but for the most part, serving doesn't come naturally to us. But I'm here to tell you this morning that that serving is more important than you know. It, it It is critical. It is very important. 
Because when you serve and you help somebody else, it not only brings fulfillment to you, right? But, but we're helping someone, we're meeting their needs. Let me say it this way. There, there's little that will fulfill you more than serving other people. There's little that will fulfill you more than serving other people. Serving invites you into being a part of something that's bigger than yourself. You know, I, I'm, I, I'll be honest with you, you know, most days because my life is, is busy, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about like myself, right? And, and, and I think that's natural. We, we do that. We think about ourselves. But serving requires us to think outside of ourselves. The Bible tells us clearly that, that Jesus was a servant. We, you don't have to read much into the Gospels to know that Jesus, his life was to serve. And not only was his life to serve, but it was a very sacrificial service, right? I think a part of the reason that we maybe hesitate to serve or wake up like, uh, because we understand that serving requires sacrifice. There's a cost to serving, right? It requires sacrifice. And so Jesus, he says to his, his disciples at one point, he says that he did not come to this world to be served, but rather he came to serve us. This was Jesus's mindset, serve others. And, and we represent, remember how a, a few weeks ago we talked about how the church does not represent or has not represented Jesus well recently, right? Let me say something. We represent Jesus best when we serve. We represent Jesus best when we serve. The American mindset, though, is the customer is always right. And, and, and businesses and, and restaurants, they, they try to make it as easy as possible for consumers to just get what they want and, and have it their way, as you've heard from the Burger King slogan, right? So you, so you get this idea that the, the Western American, you know, our, our culture tells us, like, it's all about you, right? It's all about you. It's about what you want. It's about how you feel. It's about what makes you happy, right? This is the American culture. This is the Western culture. And unfortunately, this consumer mindset, again, th this idea that like it's about me consuming, this consumer mindset ha has made its way into the church, unfortunately. And I'm, I'm going to say something really challenging, okay? So just hear me. Um, but I'm not saying that you should not go and find a church that God has called you to. Uh, of course, that's the case. But um, there are some people who are constantly changing churches, right? And they're never happy with preaching or worship or small groups or um, youth group. And, and that seems to be what, you know, what they say. And they might change churches like every six months because they never find what they're looking for. And I want you to hear my heart when I say this because I know this is, <laughs> trust me, it's very quiet in here. I know it's challenging. But you have been made by God to serve and live for something that is bigger than yourself. You have been made by God to serve and to live for something bigger than yourself. Maybe the reason that, that you're not getting much out of church sometimes is because your view of the church is a little wrong. The, the church is not a business that is called to meet your every need. Ouch. The church is a movement of people, all of us, every one of us, that has been called to serve. And guess what? You are one of those people. You, all, all of us, we are all together those people. There's this well-known story in John chapter 4 where Jesus stops at the well and he, he talks with this Samaritan woman that obviously uh, th this story, um, Jesus talking to the Samaritan, this Jew and this, G uh, this Samaritan talking, it breaks cultural barriers. But there's this scene in the story after the woman goes away, the disciples come back and they'd gone into town to grab food for themselves. And John, in, in John chapter 4, verse 31, he records this conversation. It says, starting in 31, Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And here they are thinking, that's impossible. Like, we've been doing ministry for a long time. I didn't see you sneak a Slim Jim or a Snickers bar, right? Like, you haven't eaten. There's no Burger King around to get food, right? They're like, you have not eaten. And they don't get it. They don't understand what Jesus is talking about. And then in verse 33, 
his disciples said to each other, could someone have brought him food? And then in verse 34, Jesus says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. And so essentially Jesus says, when, when others are consumers and think about me, 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 what nourishes me, what nourishes Jesus, what nourishes all of us, is when we pour our lives into the lives of others. The disciples were more worried about consuming, but Jesus was more worried about contributing. He, he looked out and he saw that people from the village were coming out to him, and he felt more revitalized. He felt refreshed and rejuvenated and filled when he was serving others and leading them to faith in him. And I do want to say, like, there is a time to consume. All of us need to sit in the presence of God and, and, and just allow him to, to rejuvenate us, right? There is a time to consume. But there is also a time to do, right? There is a time to do. And I would argue that we have greater fulfill, fulfillment and contribution than we do consumption. There is greater fulfillment in contributing than it is, there is in consuming, God's plan from the beginning was that we, you and I, would be his representatives. And as we said earlier, we've not done the greatest job. In Exodus chapter 19, verse 4 through 6, God says this to his people, the Israelites. You yourselves have have seen what I did to to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And so he called these Israelites to specifically represent him well for the sake of the world. And as they would grow and as they would obey him, he would make them more prosperous and many would see what they did. And it would all point to the glory of God, right? God would be glorified. But if you know the whole story, the Israelites, what do they do? They mess up. They fail over and over and over again. And so what does God have to do? He has to provide a solution to this mess. And the solution is his son. And so Jesus, after he, he, he's crucified and ascended, one of his 12 disciples, 12 disciples, Peter, would write these words. It says this, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We are called, just like the Israelites, to be the light of the world. We are called, just like the Israelites, to be the light of the world. In fact, Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You you might have heard this before. It says, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way... Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. And I bring up all of this to show you that from the beginning, listen, you are God's plan. You. Yes, I'm talking to you. You. You are God's plan from the beginning. Did you catch the end of the last verse? Jesus said that when you serve, people might see your good deeds and glorify the Father in heaven. That as you serve, as you get connected, as you just use your gifts and your talents and your abilities, God is glorified. But maybe you're in this room this morning and you're like, okay, Pastor Josh, I get all of that stuff. That's great. But I don't really know that I have anything to contribute. I don't know that I have any gifts or abilities or talents. Like Becca and the worship team, they did an awesome job, but you definitely don't want me up here, right? Right? Or, or maybe you're, you're in the, this room and you would say, I can't stand kids. Like, uh, don't put me in the kids area, right? Or maybe you're like, I don't like coffee, so I can't serve in the coffee. I don't, I don't know where I fit in all of this, right? I think, I think that's um, fair. That's a fair thought. Um, but I want to say this, and then I'm going to invite some people on the stage that each one of us, every one of us in here and in this world, God can and will use to impact people's lives and shape them for eternity, literally forever and ever and ever. If you don't 
think that you have a gift or an ability or a talent or a story. Let me tell you, I feel that that is a lie from the enemy. No matter what your story is, or no matter what you do or contribute, God can use those things to impact people's lives forever. And so I want to bring up a group of people that God has been using them and their, their puppies to, to impact people's lives. Can we welcome our service dogs and their mamas? I just want them to kind of introduce um, the, the pups and just kind of share a little bit about what you do. All right. Thank you, Pastor yeah. Josh. Um, I'd like to introduce the teams. Um, this is Kathy DeLand and one of her therapy dogs, Luca. They volunteer with first responders and love on a leash. And over here, this little dog is Luna and her handler, Katie. And... Um, Luna volunteers all kinds of places. Luna is also a TV star. She's been in the Puppy Bowl on ESPN. And she is Toto in The Wizard of Oz. Um, and I'm a member here, so, but those of you that don't know me, I'm Sue Kenyon, and this is one of my therapy dogs, Maya. And the reason we were invited up here today is these dogs are a great example of serving. These dogs... They serve anywhere, anytime. They'll visit anybody, do anything. We've seen them out of their comfort zone. We've seen them scared. But these dogs will go into hospitals, nursing homes, and comfort patients, staff, schools, churches, funeral homes, mental health facilities. Um, anybody that needs comfort, these dogs will be there. They're called in when there's been a suicide um, different events, they just go in and there's no scientific reason, they just provide comfort, but they never ever judge and they never refuse to serve, no matter how tired they are or how long of a day it's been. Um, we go in to see the first responders and it's just nice to give back and thank them for their service. And then they call us in if maybe they had a bad day or um, they just need some comfort and they want a dog in the debriefings. Um, we're being used by um, grief counselors, social workers, and, and like I said, the dogs just do whatever is asked of them anytime, anywhere. So thank you for having us. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. So you're like, why in the world? You know, we're these, these puppies up here, other than just being cute and saying aw, right? Uh, I, think, I think there's a really cool application here. Um, you know, I think like the, them sharing their story and you seeing how God could, could use a dog to impact somebody's life. And then there are those of us who are sitting in this room who are thinking like, I don't know what I can contribute or how I could contribute. Again, I want to say this, like God can and will use each one of us in this room if we're willing to be used by him. I want to, I want to say a few things just, you know, as Sue said, like these dogs, they, they serve without judgment, right? They're, they're, you know, you think about a police dog, they're going into dangerous situations. They don't even second guess it, right? They serve patiently and loyalty, and they expect nothing in return, right? We are commanded to serve. We know this. We read a bunch of, of scripture about this. We are commanded to serve, and, and it might not be natural to us, but listen, serving can be learned, just like these dogs, right? They didn't, you know, pop out of their mom's wombs, just service dogs, right? They were taught, right? They learned to be service dogs in the same way, too. We can learn as we grow and mature in Christ, we can learn to serve. Second thing I, I want us to see in this is like doing what Jesus says proves our faith and our trust and our love for him. The, these dogs, they do what their owners say, don't they? If Sue says sit, the dog's going to sit. If she says lay down, the dog's going to lay down. If she says do a little dance, maybe the dog does a little dance. I don't know, right? And why, and, and this is the key thing, listen, 
Why do they do this? Because the dogs have a relationship with their owner, right? Like if, if I tell them to do something, it's likely that they're going to look at me like, who in the world are you, right? But they, they, they respond and they obey because they have a relationship with their owner. And I think just as these dogs love and trust their owner in obeying Christ in our service, it's out of an abundance of love and trust that we have in him, right? If, if I serve others well, Jesus is represented well. Like these pups, again, it, it may not be natural to you, but we are made to serve. We were created to serve. You need to serve. I would say this, people in this room, there are people that may not even know each other in this room that need each other, right? Because your story touches somebody else, right? And so the service uh, or the act of serving, just like literally just handing a coffee or greeting at the front door or maybe even outside of this church, like doing something nice for someone. You know, your boss has had a hard week and so you serve them. You buy them coffee and a donut, right? Something like that. Jesus does not want us to sit on the sidelines. Another hard thing to say is, like, if, if you think that church is about just coming here every Sunday and sitting in a seat and digesting, consuming, that's not what church is about at all. It's about contributing and being a part of what God is doing and drawing others close to him. On the way out, the ushers are going to hand you a card and also a, a list of ways that you can serve here at Life in Christ, from front of house to, to ushering and greeting and, and um, coffee and all kinds of things to you know, other ministries in this church. So if you are not serving and, and maybe you want to get connected, make sure you grab one of those, fill them out. You can bring it back next week or you can drop it off at the Welcome Center this Sunday. It's really quick to fill out, so it shouldn't take very long. So this week, I want to challenge you in closing, okay? Find one person around you to serve this week. Look for opportunities to serve people. Look for opportunities for people to see the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you, on the outside of you, actively participating in what God is doing. Here's my last point. God has wired each of us to find fulfillment and purpose, not in what we get, but in what we give. 